Welcome back to the lobby of the Hotel Orloff. It's probably Saturday, July 8th, 2023, in the year of our Lord. Um, just received a package. Let's open that up. Um, it was only mailed two days ago. The post office seems to be getting things across the country lightning fast. Um, that's pretty cool. So let's see. Um, just finished watching the uh, Rod and Shannon show uh, Comic Book Memories, which is on every Saturday morning. And I was kind of doing other things and, and, and listening, and, and, and uh, um, I was brushing my teeth, and I heard someone in the chat was talking about a. Warren magazine called 1984, which later changed its name to 1994, because uh, the magazine started about 1980 probably, and it was uh, they were trying to Warren was trying to do a heavy metal uh, kind of uh, magazine. I was just showing it last issue, uh, last issue, last episode, and I only have three copies of it because uh, as a kid I bought it and and. Uh, and felt, uh, you know, as a kid, let's see, I would have been like 15. And as I looked through this, uh, you know, I knew that creepy and eerie pushed the limits uh, to, you know, PG-13 kind of territory. But this magazine, the artwork was wonderful in it. But I, I guess they thought to compete with this uh, heavy metal foreign reprints that they had to amp up the... The... Um, Vileness, uh, I think on mycomicshop.com they warn you that it's uh, a downright sleazy when, when they're trying to sell it to you. It, this, the artwork's great, but it feels like it's written by Jeffrey Epstein. Um, or or uh, what's the name of the American Psycho guy? It's, it's like it's written by a serial killer and Jeffrey Epstein combined and uh, throw in a little Charles Manson. Uh, and the, it's got the wonderful artwork you're used to in Warren magazines, but it's like, what are they doing? And so I only bought a few issues. Anyway, I heard someone in the chat talking about, it. oh, it's, it's underrated. And then so I, I put a comment, because I, uh, I just wanted to warn people, don't get this magazine. And I, I said, it's, it's, hey, the magazine's kind of vile. Uh, artwork's great, but it's pretty reprehensible. And then, I and then I went back and realized, and I kind of zoomed back and started, oh no, these are people I like that were liking it. And, and, and so I, I deleted my comment, but apparently when I deleted it, it didn't delete from, <laughs> so, he, so Rod read my comment. And, and, and then it turns out, I, 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 I rewatched that part later that I had missed, and it was Rod that was showing, uh, he was showing an issue, and I was so embarrassed. He was showing this issue and talking about how it's really good, great science fiction, and 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 I was thinking this is this is the one that's got a story where they're this cannibal story that I, I can't even talk about on YouTube how bad it is, and I couldn't explain in the comments because I couldn't write what's in this book in YouTube comments because it would create a problem. It's that bad. It's Jeffrey Epstein times ten level kind of uh, stuff, you know. It's like if Jeffrey Epstein, Hunter Biden, and Charles Manson all had a baby together, that would be whoever's writing the stories in this. And I, I was like embarrassed. <laughs> it's like, then I, I said, well, I deleted my previous comment, sorry. And then then I deleted that comment. But anyway, they never deleted, and, and Rod read them all. And I just, I, and, 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 and Rod was saying, well, opinions vary. And it's like, oh shoot, I feel, I feel bad for insulting this magazine. But the magazine, I I don't think most people that, that love this magazine have actually read it. Or, although if you look at the artwork, you don't really have to read it to see. It's bad, trust me. I mean, it's, it's just, I don't know. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend anyone. Speaking of offensive, I got this in the mail today. It says America's best days could be ahead, but not 
if these are our only choices. What does it say? Joe Biden will defeat Donald Trump if he is the GOP nominee. <laughs> America needs new leadership. Our country needs a leader with a vision to lead us to prosperity, restore our economy, and unite the nation. So, and the media is making fun of Trump because yesterday, during uh, during his speech in Council Bluffs, uh, he uh, he accidentally said "markers" instead of "Marxist," and then he, in the next sentence, he said "Marxist completely fine," and then um, and then as he was speaking, it sounded like he said uh, "cunny" instead of "country," and then they said he made two mistakes in in a, in two minutes. It's like, have you listened to any Biden speeches lately? Oh, man. All right. Wonderful. Fantastic. So this is moronic. Obviously, you need to vote for Donald Trump and support him. He'll be in Nevada today. I'll be watching that. Uh, right Side Broadcasting goes on with that today at 5 o'clock, and I'll be tuned into that. Um... Yeah, I'll show you what I got here in this package. I want to. I want to take a look at this. See what? Maybe my memory's bad on this magazine. Okay, so it's not a good time period for Warren. But I can't show you because it's got beautiful art. There's Alex Nino. I can't show you what's bad. Ooh, look at this double page spread ad for the Rook. That's great. I cannot show you what's bad in this book. Yeah, there's, see, there's already. Beautiful uh, Richard Corbin art. Um, oh, I know, this is why they lost Richard Corbin. Richard Corbin did this story, Mutant World, and they changed his dialogue and, and I guess made it more perverse, and he, he wouldn't work for. Uh, Warren anymore. He said, "My, what I give you, you print it the way I give it to you. And Richard Corbin was famous for going pretty far with his artwork and everything. And they, uh, but they had to make it more adult, you know. So, I don't know okay, let's see what I got in this box. Hmm. All right. It's a, a big little book, Bugs Bunny and the Pirate Loot. But I, the, the funny thing about this cover is if you put it like, if you look at it like this, it looks like he's about to stab Porky Pig in the back of the head, but it's actually a torch. Bugs Bunny has some crazed looking eyes here. It's big little books. These were very valuable um, 20, 30 years ago. The generation that read these when they were little kids is pretty much gone, unfortunately. And the value has dropped on these books. But there's still people out there that want them. So um, there's still demand for them. But there's not the demand that there used to be. And you know the laws of supply and demand. The more people want something, the more valuable it is. Um, from Whitman Publishing Company. And it's, this isn't actually, this is a, isn't actually a big little book. It's a better little book. The first thing I noticed, this is a little bit smaller than a big little book. And big little books had a page of text and then a, 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 then a, a drawing. This, is basically a comic book in this form. And it's uh, all, all cartoons. So that's pretty cool. This is from, oh, my glass. You know, I can't find my glasses that I use to watch television. I, I, I don't I have no idea where they're at. Uh, I found some reading glasses. Where are my reading glasses? I got, I'm all messed up, man. This is uh, 1944. So it's not technically a big little book, a little smaller. It's a better little book. So, fantastic. Speaking of James Warren, 
Um, I got the biography of James Warren that came out recently. I was not paying attention and uh, missed out on getting the hardcover version. And that's now, people are selling that for like upwards of $100. So I had to settle for the soft cover edition. James Warren, Empire of Monsters. And I wonder, that might be interesting to find in here, the section on 1984 and, and, and you know, why they were tempted to go that far with the book, man. It just, it just made me want to take a shower after I read it. Let's see, the end in slow motion. It's probably going to be in this chapter, the end. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Let's see what I'm talking about. Um, well, they're talking about the very end of uh, when they auctioned off all his stuff. Well, I'm going to enjoy reading this. All right, so that's fantastic. Oh, uh, Toddy Walnuts, you ordered some um, of the Tomb of Terror, and uh, you sent uh, $40, and $40 is, you know, it's their $20 each, plus, including postage, but then you were saying, I want to eventually order all of them, so if you could have me, um, so, so basically, once you, once you order four, the price drops to $16 each because if I have a little, if I send a little envelope with two or three, it costs about $6 to send them. But if I send a box with a whole, with like 15 of them in it, it costs about $6. So, so I was given a $4 price drop once you get four or more. That's the price I was giving to Kevin at Gotham City Comics. That's where this stuff came from, by the way. Uh, Kevin Johnson, the owner and proprietor of Gotham City Comics, just got this package this morning from him. He sent it from Mesa, Arizona two days ago and it arrived here this morning about nine. So that's incredible how quick his shipping is and how quick the post office has been working as well. At least the post offices between here and there are very efficient. I don't know if they're that way across the country. Um, so, um, I think, I'm not good with math, but if, uh, then if, I, if I sent, you know, if there was, if I sent four, then you could, then you get the $16 price and then um, so that would I'd have to figure that out because I don't have a pen and paper and I, and I can't use the calculator on the phone because I'm recording with the phone but uh, yeah I could either send two to you or, or I could hold on and then uh, um, give you know if you send enough to make it whatever 16 times 4 is what is that 50 something if you sent the difference to make up to that then I could send you the first four episodes and you'd get the $16 price. I don't know why I'm wasting time on this. It's Because that's how I communicate with people best. I'm not good at texting because all I do is put in wrong letters or embarrass myself and talk about how much I hate a book that the host has just showed and said he liked. That was embarrassing as heck. I'm so sorry I did that. It's just I get opinionated about some of this stuff. And I need to be quiet. I need to stop being in the chat on on people's videos that's what i need to do because uh that was not a one of my finest moments that's probably why i'm hated in this community you know i'm not uh, well liked except by the few handful of people that actually watch the show and they probably can barely tolerate me um like um Spinnerack Studios was saying, you were hard to get used to, but I grew to like you. It's just you were <laughs> hard to... Uh, okay, so anyway, so I got the James Warren uh, biography, but that's considered a graphic novel or a book, and so he's having a sale, a Christmas in July sale at Gotham City Comics. You could 
call and talk to him and see what you could get. Uh, but anyway, because right now you, you buy one, get one. BOGO. Buy one, get one. So of same or lesser value. And so what I did is because I got that James Warren, I was able to get this free. This is a um, reprints the this is volume one reprinting creepy uh, magazine with you know slick paper and they have the letter page too that's good I wonder if they have the ads they don't have the house ads but they have the letter pages which is basically the way they do it when, when you buy these omnibus books omnibuy whatever at least the Marvel ones, they give you the, the cover, the, all the story, and, and then they give you the letter page, or maybe the editorial um, the bullpen page. I don't know if they give you that. Oh, they do have some ads, actually. But do they have all the ads? I think they just have occasional ads in here. Trial of Adam Link. That's a robot that... That actually goes back, uh, I think, to the pulp days, the Adam Link stories. They, get, they reprint a few ads in here to give you a taste of what the ads were like. That may be the only page of ads they reprint. This is great, though. So that's fantastic. Um, this is the new issue of Vampirus Carmilla. I was showing you Vampirella. This is the modern uh, equivalent of it. This is a company called Warrant. Not Warren, as in James Warren, but uh, Warrant. And th these are the issues of Vampirus Carmilla they've published so far. And that's their version of Vampirella, which is um, as close as they can get without complete copyright infringement from the people at Harris that own that character now. It would be better if this company owned Vampirella because they're doing a much better job with Vampirella without actually doing Vampirella. And this is another magazine they publish called Shudder that's basically a modern version of Creepy. Now, usually when they people do new versions of old things, Oh, then they also put out a magazine called Monster Bash, which is their version of Famous Monsters. They basically have brought back James Warren's magazine line for modern times, and it looks pretty authentic to the way the art would have looked in the late 60s in uh, Creepy Eerie, or in the very early days of Vampirella. Now, what it looks like they have Okay, what they've started to do, there's Vampirus Carmilla. They've started to, in the early issues of this, it was just called Vampirus Carmilla. Now they're actually giving a story to Vampirus Carmilla. So she actually, she's driving in a car with uh, Universal Monsters there. Um, the artwork is this artwork does not look really vampirella like but it is good artwork it 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 looks this artwork looks kind of like british comic book art from the 1980s that you would have seen in 2000 AD that is not i'm not knocking it it's it looks it has that that look of being British. The art is by Reno Manaqua. The story is by Don Glute. Don Glute was an actual Warren writer. I believe he edits or at least proofreads. Let me check and see what his position is. He's the associate editor, Don Glute. The cover is by San Julian, a actual artist from the Warren days. That, um, None of the other artists that are in here I have heard of. Nick Pol Polico, Reno Manaqua, 
Santos Zabalos, Mikhail Bergvist, Rodel Nura. Um, some of these names, Mikhail Bergvist, I, I bet that's very possible, like a Ukrainian artist or something. There are a lot of artists that you that will do artwork for your. You got some ideas, but you can't draw. You have ideas for a comic book. You can get artists from the Ukraine, from some of these countries where they need work, that are really good artists, and they will illustrate your story and send you the art, probably digitally, and then you can publish your comic. There, it's. I don't think it's ever been easier to publish a comic. Um, some friends of mine back in Texas had put out five, six comics of uh, their channel planet. Uh, they've been on this show several times as guests. And uh, they do some of the art, but they, they get these artists, really talented artists, that audition for them from send them pages of samples of their art and they get these really great artists which I think was what they're doing here and uh, and uh, then they get their then you it's pretty cheap you can get a whole bunch of books published from all these publishers will print comics for you but uh, oh, we, we were looking at Vampires Carmilla when uh, the camera shut off last time so I don't have many of these Vampirus Carmillas. They've been hard to get. Let's see, this is um, one issue that, that uh, um, number three, four. Um, they were they're just hard to get because right when I was live where I was living in Texas, the stores wouldn't carry it. They carry it if you'd order it. This issue five. Um, and I started ordering it from a store and then I had to move. Well, I didn't have to, I wanted to move. Um, it's number six. Um, this is the very last, um, artwork ever published by Richard Corbin. By this point he'd passed away. So this is, uh, I guess the last published art from him. This one came damaged. See, it's got, an average person wouldn't consider that damage, but if you're a comic collector, you don't like the printing defect. So, um, as I recall, I got this one free. Um, and then he reordered it, and I guess the next week I got this one. That's what I remember. I've ordered some... I, I've got to get organized. I've ordered a Vampirus Carmilla from Gotham City Comics. I think it's in another box. I need to get it in here with these. This is the reordered one that doesn't have the damage. Um, that's from March of 2022. And then this is September of 2023. So, issues 7 to 16. I'm missing a few. But a few of them I have in other... Um, I have them downstairs. I mean upstairs. Or somewhere. <laughs> um, but I put these right after my Vampirellas in this box. Because I think... Oh, here's an issue of Blazing Combat. This is the war comic that Warren did in the mid-60s during the Vietnam War. This is issue three with the Frazetta cover. Um, here's another Warren magazine that was, um, I think this is very early 1960s, Screen Thrills Illustrated. It's kind of like Famous Monsters, except it's all the other kinds of movies from that time period. Tarzan, Laurel and Hardy, uh, women from old movie serials. Superman has jumped from comics to television. So this was um, kind of like a companion magazine to Famous Monsters. Famous Monsters was selling 
So they put out this magazine, then they had a separate one called Westerns or Wild Westerns. It was all about Western movies. And then they had another one that was about, um, they had another one. Uh, oh, Spacemen, about science fiction movies. The only one that lasted, though, was Famous Monsters. Okay. Oh, here's a Wonder Warthog magazine. Okay, well, I haven't finished going through what I got in the package, so let's take a look. I'm watching Space Giants. Um, there's a guy that has a playlist of the whole series of Space Giants on YouTube, and never really watched Space Giants. I've seen little clips from it and pictures from it in magazines, and I thought, I ought to record some episodes of Space Giants. So I just recorded some episodes this morning, and um, this is my second collection of space it was a live action Japanese show brought over to the US television in the um, 60s okay here's Bugs Bunny hot rod hair and then he had a coverless uh, just only the cover for Wonder Woman number 10. I can't read that. Whatever it says there, Wonder Woman number something. And uh, I thought, and he just he just gave me the cover. So, um, Bugs Bunny, Dell, number 355. I think this cover is great. I love hot rods. I love Bugs Bunny. Fantastic. Here's uh, Bugs Bunny finds the frozen kingdom. Got a bit of a spine roll. There are people in the people out there watching this that know how to. Um, what the heck do they call it? They don't call it ironing comics, they call them uh, flattening. I can never remember the terminology. There are people that know how to uh, press, that's what they call it, pressing them. They know how to press these things. This is from 1947. Beautiful. Bugs Bunny, please. It's obvious that you're lying, because I usually get shot touching the right wire. So this is a uh, fantastic. Add this to my Dell, Dell collection. It's Bugs Bunny 164. So and that other one was three. What did I say? 55. So this is now one of the oldest comics in my collection. I will. Um, Put this on a comic wall at some point in the future when I have a comic wall. It's possible. It could happen. My goodness. Space Giants, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, this is a brand new book that comes out, I think it came out a couple of days ago. It's um, it's a facsimile of my greatest adventure, number eighty, with the first appearance of the Doom Patrol, and it looks pretty real. I have to say, it looks pretty real. The only thing it's missing is the twelve cent price tag that would be there, and so. Uh, that's pretty, pretty cool, man. So I have a lot of Doom Patrol 
1960s books because I dearly love the Doom Patrol, but I don't have the original. And they're smart. They finally figured out we can put the UPC code on the back, and it's not as obtrusive. Hmm. They don't even mess with the ads. Sometimes on these reprints, they'll put not not still valid or something so some dummy doesn't cut this out and try to send off for a hundred toy soldiers um or, or they'll they'll white out the address but they still have the address there so someone could actually uh send off okay well let's take a look it looks like the page quality You can tell this is, you know, like, they don't have the original art to go from, so you can tell that's a, a copy of that, because if you had the original comic, his face wouldn't look so muddy. But it looks like they're, they're trying to make the paper feel like old comic paper, too, because I noticed with a lot of facsimiles, I think maybe the ones from Marvel are, are guilty of having them printed on slick paper, which immediately is a giveaway that it just doesn't feel like an old comic. This feels more like an old comic, but it, like it's come right off the newsstand because it still has that gritty feeling of newsprint. Um, uh, it, it, some of the art looks a little muddy, like maybe they weren't working with the original artwork or didn't have access to the original artwork. I don't know, but it looks, this, this is probably the, uh, the, they've been putting out tons of facsimiles lately. This one looks like it's the closest to looking like the real thing. This is, um, the closest they've come of all the facsimiles I've seen to really looking real. Oh, what is that? Well, they, there's something down here that's a little questionable. I hope that's not saying we printed this on recycled paper, because there's a picture of a tree there, which makes me uh, concerned that... Uh, I can't breathe into that, man. P-E-F-C. I'll have to look that up later. Man, I can't see anything. Wherever my glasses are, man, I, I had them on because we were watching The Marvelous Miss Maisel, and they've been missing a couple of days. I hope they're not in the dog's stomach, man. Okay. Yeah, buddy. What's interesting... When, when it goes to the monsters that they're fighting and they're talking on their own to each other, they go to the original Japanese dialogue track and have subtitles. And when the heroes are talking, they speak English with a slight Japanese accent. So, uh, oh man, you gotta see this. Let me, let me disconnect you so you can see how wonderful this is. Can you see that on the television? The wonderfulness that I'm seeing on this great Saturday morning. Well, we have three, four minutes left of Saturday morning. I don't know. Or maybe these are scenes that weren't in the English dub. And to be completest, they've, uh, they've, they've included the Japanese scenes. That could be. Because it said restored space giants. So that might be what's going on. I don't know. Yesterday I was watching Marine Boy, which is one of the 60s uh, cartoons like Speed Racer and Astro Boy, but it's one I'd never seen. It's color. Uh, he's like a little, little Aquaman kind of kid. Anyway. Actually, I wasn't watching it. I put it on to record. I'll watch it later. I was, what, I was recording that while I was doing yesterday's live stream. Here's Walt Disney's Vacation Parade. Um, Kevin Johnson at Gotham City Comics got thousands 
of comics from this time period from one gentleman that brought him in about a week and a half ago. Thousands. We went through them on a live stream. And then uh, um, I, ma I made a pile of ones. Hold these for me. Gra uh, Graphic Man, Micah made a pile. Jambo made a pile. I let Captain Strange Life know there's some rain covers with rainy days on the cover. He called up and got some rainy covers pulled for him. Um, and then, you know, it's like, okay, well, we'll, we'll maybe it'll always be there. No one's going to buy these books but us, but some, someone came in and bought all of them. And so, luckily, we pulled our piles. And uh, so... Uh, that collection's pretty much gone. There were some big little books left, um, and uh, we each pulled some. And then one night I said, uh, I, I contacted Kevin and said, hey, there's a few, or did that guy that came in and bought everything, did he get the big little books? And he said, no. Nah. And I said, well, pull, a, pull about five more for me, this one, this one, this one. And then if I hadn't have done that, the next day that guy came back and bought all the rest of the big little books that we didn't have pulled. So. So anyway, we, we were able to, uh, through the magic of the internet, we were able to at least get first pickings from uh, the uh, pile. This one I love, it's another car cover, and I just love this, uh, this here. It says, um, come along with us for extra vacation fun. There were no video games back then, or cell phones, or tablets to stare at. This book would be entertainment for, this is a summer vacation fun. For when it was raining and you weren't out, you know, playing baseball or riding your bike or doing the things that kids used to do in the old days. Oh, the maze was done. So they made it out of that maze. Um, and gradually all, uh, oh, look, the truant officer is there. Trail the truants. Where can all the pupils be on the first day of school? Have they all played hooky? No, they're just having fun hiding from Mickey and Daisy. Can you find them? Oh, okay, so somewhere in this picture are all the truant students that are cutting class. They're ditching school. you got to help them find them. Um, who wants to help out a truant officer find the truant kids? That's... Uh... Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, he, he apparently reused the bag. I did not pay $399.99 for that. Um... <laughs> He, uh, but he had the bag backwards. That's why he had it backwards. So the price. <laughs> I'm gonna put it in the right way, and then when I when I pass away, my wife will look through my comic boxes and go, oh, "Shit, he paid three, four hundred dollars for this beat up comic book." But no, if you watch this video at some point in the future, Cleo, I did not pay three hundred. I. I, this was very inexpensive, but I love the optical illusion there. <laughs> I, I, I always like the the three hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents. Well, at least it's not four hundred dollars. I'm <laughs> we're, we're psychologically that they've always fooled us, right? It's ninety nine cents. Oof, well, at least it's not a dollar. Uh, that's, that actually works, you know, that psychologically actually works, uh, people. Okay. All right. So how are you guys doing this wonderful day? Wonderful, right? It's, uh... I hate to tell you this, but it's like in the 60s here, and uh, where you can just leave your door or windows open, and, and um, 
because I hear it's pretty bad some parts of the country. This is Mighty Mouse number, oh, number 20, it says down at the bottom. Fighting a monster. That's a pretty good monster. Gandy Goose. This makes makes me want to watch some Gandy Goose and Mighty Mouse cartoons later today on this uh, YouTube platform here. Okay. <laughs> the Lone Ranger. <laughs> He's reusing these bags that says uh, 200, unless he's being funny, $299.99. He might have put those price tags on there just to be funny. I don't know. Or he's reusing bags from very expensive books. The Lone Ranger Western Treasury. Yeah, that's way out west. It doesn't even show Texas. Oh, it does on the back cover. Oh, it's it's meant to be like this. So, oh, it shows the different trails. Stage, you know the. They keep, they're tearing, they're expanding their driveway next door and they got steam shovels and jackhammers that, oh, this artwork's beautiful. This looks very much like when we were looking at that Doom Patrol, that fake Doom Patrol, uh, My Greatest Adventure. Um, yeah, it pretty much looked like, and see, these pages are very white. This is, uh, and this book is, uh, I'm betting it's from about 1953. Let me see here. Where's the damn? 1954. I was gonna say 54. Did I say 50? I said 53, or did I say 54? I don't know what I said. Anyway, definitely while the TV show was on, because ever since the TV show, Lone Ranger's shown with the blue shirt. I'm going to put it in the bag. It was in the bag backwards. I'm going to put it in with the $300 price tag facing out. <laughs> $300. It, it, you know, this was, I didn't pay anywhere close to that. Um, okay, my goodness gracious. today man I feel like there's something I'm supposed to do here's Donald Duck fun book <laughs> oh, this is actually um, all a fun uh, Thing to do. It's not actually a comic book. It's all uh, this kind of stuff. But none of it's actually been done by the original owner kid, which is very strange. Oh, there are some comics in here. I take it back. Yeah, there's a lot of comics in here. I just was looking on the wrong pages. Yeah, I was always kind of skeeved out a little bit by the Warren magazines and over the years. I, I felt guilty 
a lot of times, you know, reading them as a kid because they would put some of the violence and uh, kind of R-rated stuff they would throw in at books in the books that um, made me just feel wrong and creepy, eerie, and vampirella and um uh, yeah, as I was looking at one uh, yesterday or whenever I did the Vampirella and it's like, it's like, I kind of, I don't know, you may have seen me make a reaction, but there's like this knife being plunged right into this woman's, uh, you know, right below her rib cage and I'm thinking, and, and like a sacrifice. And I'm thinking, I, that stuff bothered me as a kid. And there was one that some people say is a really acclaimed story. Neil Adams was the illustrator, beautiful art, but it was about a sniper. And uh, he's, it's kind of like the Charles Joseph Whitman sniper incident in uh, the 60s at UT Austin. And you see people getting shot through the head and their glasses flying off. And this one woman gets shot and, and is kneeling down and blood squirting out of her. And, and you have this shocked look on her face. And it's like, okay, this... And people talk about it. Oh, it's such a commentary on today's violence. No, it's just, it really struck you as just sick. Like, this is really, this, this magazine's aimed at people that are really, just really enjoying this violence. And I remember looking at that at the newsstand when I was uh, 13, 14, and thinking, I don't know about this. Uh, I think to the point where I didn't even buy that magazine. And I think I bought it. I bought it later because, you know, that story was reprinted a couple of times. And it, but the. When they did 1984 and 1994, they pushed it so far that I just. Uh, I thought, man, I, 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 I can't do this magazine. Because despite loving monsters and all of this stuff. I really have conservative values. I'm a religious person. Um, and, you know, I just thought, you know, <laughs> how do I justify this? This I, I don't know. It just, a, a book that kind of, well, they say good art affects you, you know, good art creates a reaction but I don't know this was uh, basically free it's not in very good shape but it's an issue of Conan that I didn't have at least I don't think I have it oh shoot I didn't realize there's a whole pay half a page gone but I think it was um, yeah you <laughs> this this uh, uh, this kid that owned these uh, Conan books was uh, who does that? How dare you? Whatever kid you were, wherever you were, yeah, half a page gone. <laughs> oh well, he must have wanted to uh, uh, order something from an ad on the bo bottom of this page here. <laughs> so that he didn't have a pair of scissors handy. But he tore out the coupon, the coupon Conan style. It's like, I don't need scissors, I'll just. What do you think of Conan with the Arnold Schwarzenegger accent? Is that the accent you visualized, or you visualize it, that you heard when you read the Conan books before? The Conan movie came out. Did you hear in your mind Conan talking like Arnold Schwarzenegger? I didn't. And after the movie came out, when I read Conan books or Savage Sword of Conan, I still didn't hear Arnold Schwarzenegger's voice. I don't, you know, he did great as Conan, but that's not the voice I hear in my mind. Or the accent. So we could have had an accent like that. Um, what they should have done, um, um, 
let's see. Well, who was the guy that played Conan's father in, in the beginning of Conan the Barbarian? He was like a, he was a, man, was it William Smith? He was like a, a character. He was an actor that was in a lot of biker movies. He was a tough guy, a character actor. And he played Conan's father, and he presented him as a little kid with a sword and talked about the riddle of steel and, and Krom, their god, and all that, remember? And then the next scene... There's a battle, and his father's killed, and he gets taken captive, whatever. Anyway, he's about eight, nine years old. Um, he, his father didn't have a German or an Austrian accent. And if they had had his father speak with that accent, then it would have made sense for Schwarzenegger's accent uh, to be throughout the movie, because that's the accent of the Sumerians, according to... Uh, that John Milius movie, but since his father didn't have that accent, it strikes you as a little odd. And so, well, he picked up that accent from his slavers. Now, whatever accent you've got when you're nine or ten, however he is in that beginning scene, that's pretty much the accent you're going to have throughout your life. Why would he pick up an accent from slavers? I don't know. Uh, okay. Well, buddy. So, what else can I show you here? Oh, they used to give this out free at the comic store. This is from 1990. Kitchen sink pipeline. Uh, uh, they had this candy box of Cadillacs and dinosaurs. Mark Schultz. I see that there's a variant cover for uh, whoever, who's doing the Conan the Barbarian comic now. Marvel had the rights back, but now it's gone to someone else. Anyway, Mark Schultz did a Conan the Barbarian cover, and it's, uh, you can get it for $15 from some comic store. It's uh, exclusive to some comic store somewhere in the United States. Uh, variant cover. I don't like variant covers, but I like Mark Schultz. Um, here's a G.I. Joe fanzine. Action figure exchange. And it just adds. This is what, this is how collectors had to uh, collect before the days of, you know, eBay and the internet. This was a fun magazine, Model and Toy Collector. You guys remember this magazine? It uh, from spring of 1989. It's issue 12. Obviously, it's a Batman issue because um, Batman was just coming out the uh, Michael Keaton movie. And look at this. They promise in the next issue, monsters. Do I have the next issue? Damn. The next issue I've got is number... That's uh, special, number two. If there was a monster issue, how did I not get it? Oh. Oh, here it is. This is the next issue. Of course I have it. This was available at, at the... The book stop, I think it was, right by the Park Mall in Arlington, Texas. And yeah, see, this is before the internet, so this is how you would become aware of all the Batman collectibles out there in, in magazines like this. Uh, they reprint the instruction sheet for the Batmobile. This is uh, incredible stuff. Look at that. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is the stuff, this is the stuff, man. Um, yeah, when that 1989 movie came out, it was a big deal. Now, I understand that Flash movie is a complete bomb. It did worse than Black Adam, and they're... 
I haven't seen it. I've heard many people that say they loved it. Um, I'm hearing really good things about A Sound of Freedom. Um, there, I, I've seen some reviews where they trash it and the type people that would like it and you realize, oh, this is from The Village Voice or this is from Rolling Stone. These are the type people that are probably guilty of or in support of the things that they're fighting against in that movie. Like Jeffrey Epstein probably wouldn't have liked a sound of freedom much. He probably would have said, thumbs down, Roger. But uh, I, I, I haven't seen the movie yet, but it looks like you can kind of tell a lot about what path someone's on in life by whether or not they like that movie. So, anyway, hopefully I'll see the movie. I don't know if it's going to play here locally. This is the monster issue. Looks like... Is it a wraparound cover? No, it isn't. It's a separate illustration on the back. Let's see how far we into this recording here. Oh, I only have eight minutes left on this uh, disc. Um, okay. So they show the nice pictures. Uh, article on famous monsters. Oh, look what they give you here. They reprint the Godzilla Aurora instruction sheet. Now there's a book you can get that reprints all the instruction sheets from the 1960s model kits. I have it back there in the library somewhere. I don't know, I'm, I'm not fully organized after the move here um, last April. We moved here about a, a year and three months ago and I'm still trying to figure out what's going on around here. Um, so I have the monster issue, that's very good news. And they have a Dick Tracy issue because they're trying to um, leapfrog over, I don't know, what's the right cliche? Uh, after Batman, I just, just realized something. When Batman was uh, on TV in 1966, was a huge success. The same producers decided they'd make a Dick Tracy TV show. And they filmed a pilot. Um, I think Eve Plum, who was, I think, Marsha, not Marsha, uh, Jan, in uh, The Brady Bunch when she was younger in 1966, 67, uh, was um, whatever the name of that little girl is. In the, um, Dick Tra anyway, they made a Dick Tracy pilot. They had the Ventures do the theme song. It didn't get... Um, didn't go to air. Um, they were thinking of doing a horrible, they had a wonder, horrible idea for a Wonder Woman series where she was this ugly woman that fantasized that she looked like Wonder Woman, but in reality she was ugly and only looked that way when, to herself in the mirror. And that would have been a really stupid uh, thing. Instead of doing a straight Wonder Woman, they only filmed a like eight, eight minute little pilot for that. And finally, they did the Green Hornet, which was great, but it only lasted one season. It wasn't the hit they thought it was. But anyway, years later in 1989, when they made the Michael Keaton Batman, Tim Burton Batman, the, the next thing Hollywood did to kind of cash in on the Batman thing was do a Dick Tracy movie with um, Warren Beatty. So anyway, this issue is kind of, when, when the Dick Tracy movie came out, probably the next year in 1990, they... They have this special, it's its model and toy collector, so it's all kinds of Dick Tracy toys, pictures of just about every Dick Tracy toy that came out. Oh, and here's pictures from that Dick Tracy pilot, Dick Tracy's wife, and there's the girl I was just talking about, uh, whose name is uh, Bonnie Braids. That's what I thought. I was about to say Braids. Um, and the guy that played... Guy that played Dick Tracy 
was was really look like Dick Tracy, right? He looks like the guy that played him in the serial. It could have been a good show, you know. It uh, it might have been. The uh, Warren Beatty movie was was odd and that it tried to recreate the look of the comic strip with this garish colors and everybody looked like a freak except for Warren Beatty and Madonna. But if Warren Beatty, who was very vain, you know the song You're So Vain by Carly Simon was supposed to be about Warren Beatty. Most people say that's the case because she, you know, had dated him briefly. But Warren Beatty being vain, I don't think would have allowed himself to be given a prosthetic pointy chin or, you know, alterations to his face. But all the villains were altered to look like they did in the comic strip. But, you know, those villains, there was a scene where these villains were playing poker or something, the bad guys, and someone comes in and just sprays them with machine gun fire and kills them all. All these great villains that in the comic strip took Dick Tracy like a year to, before he finally shot him in the forehead, which he would do because it was a violent comic strip. Um, and then they would come back or, you know, or or their wife would come back to get revenge. You know, it was like prune face, flat top. All the great villains were just wiped out. And uh, if if everyone was altered to look horrible, including Madonna and and uh, all the, you know, then it, I don't know. Would it have worked? I don't know. Um, so that was what, what happened with Batman 89 was the Flash. And then TV did a... I'm sorry. Batman, it was Dick, Tr Dick Tracy was the imitation, and then on television they did a Flash TV show to try to look like Tim Burton's Batman. And then they had fake muscles built on into his suit to like Tim Burton's Batman. That show didn't last very long either. Um... I don't know. Um, these are probably pretty cheap on, on eBay. There's an alien issue. Here's a Green Hornet issue, number 18. Oh, and then... I forgot about this. They had an Adams Family issue. But unfortunately, it has that modern Adams family, and that's the Adams family I love. Is the '60s Adams family? I was not a huge fan of the the movie Adams Family. It 